AI or artificial intelligence is routinely presented to us as a monolithic technology, clean, clear and game changing. People talk about the era of AI and AI powered systems and worlds. It feels inescapable, a future that we are marching toward or already in. So why would other stories about AI be valuable or useful? Well, I believe that we need to tell other stories about AI's past, its present and even its future. Stories that reveal other truths and other possibilities and make room for a more sustainable, safe and responsible AI and ultimately a more human centric one. So where would you start? Well, you'd start by looking at AI's founding moments. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. Those words frame a research proposal written in 1955 to fund a two month, 10 man study at Dartmouth College the following summer. The authors came from elite American organizations, Harvard, MIT, Bell Telephone Labs, IBM Research and they had diverse backgrounds and interests. And they had an ambitious agenda to make machines think like humans. The expectation was that computing technology would continue along the expansive trajectory established in the late 1940s and 1950s. The participants imagined a vast array of computational power and tremendous possibility. And as a result, they believed that much of that initial research agenda could be achieved within a decade. This was not to be. But the important thing to remember here is that AI isn't new. It's not a 21st century thing. We've been talking about it since 1955. And in fact, whilst the term might have been coined in 1955, the ideas started even earlier. From 1946 to 1953, the Macy's conferences convened 10 meetings in New York City and Princeton, bringing together a range of thinkers from across the disciplinary spectrum to explore the ideas of the human, machine, nature system. They called this cybernetics. Curated in part by anthropologists Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, the meetings were radically interdisciplinary and represented an attempt to constitute a whole new body of academic knowledge and a whole new discipline. The attendees were a remarkable roll call of big thinkers. Shannon, Licklider, Von Neumann, McCulloch, Ashby, Rosenbluth, Wiener. They were inventing the future and many of them would go on to be present again in 1956 in person or in spirit. Looking back on it 30 years later, Mead described it like this. In a sense, it was the most interesting conference I'd ever been in because no one knew how to manage these things yet. Ultimately, cybernetics proved to be contested territory and it was unduly linked to forms of social engineering that were unpalatable in 1950s America. And so it's been conveniently forgotten inside the AI story. Of course, there are lots of kinds of forgetting and silences when it comes to AI. For as much as we can forget that AI was a term coined in 1955, we can also forget that the first conference was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and had participation from two of America's biggest companies at that time, IBM and Bell Telephone. Oh yeah, and the Rand Corporation, with its very complicated relationship to the United States military, was also an active backer. In focusing just on the technological piece of AI, we sometimes miss the other bits, where the resources came from, why and what interests were being served by them. We can also ignore that it's not just one AI, but many built inside many companies and governments and non-governmental organizations across the whole world. In different locations, based on different data sets and different constraints, and even managed through different frameworks and regulations. And all of those different AIs, they do different kinds of work. Some are about efficiencies and productivities, others are about safety and control, and yet others are about surveillance and desire. In 1956, the original AI proposal made mention of AI and creativity. And the authors speculated about how AI might make new artistic forms. <laughs> but that speculation gave way quickly to more conservative understandings of intelligence. Things about strategy, reasoning and language. Yet, a little more than 10 years after Dartmouth, on the other side of the Atlantic, a remarkable woman installed her first exhibit. She called it Cybernetic Serendipity and it showcased work sitting at the ex intersections of computing and art. It had music, light, poetry, sculpture, all created with and through computers. Jasa Reichart was interested in the ways that randomness would make art, and she imagined that computers would surely play a part in that. One of the pieces exhibited there was called Return to a Square. It was art created using Fortran, an early programming language. It was created by a group of artists in Japan calling themselves the Computer Technique Group, and it was sponsored by IBM Research in Japan. That group's manifesto suggested a completely different way of framing AI, one that was relational and involves humans and society, never just the technology. In the manifesto, they wrote as follows, we will tame the computer's appealing transcendental charm and restrain it from serving established power. 
This stance is the way to solve complicated problems in machine society. Those are five stories about AI, and they certainly aren't the usual ones. Each represents a different way into AI and opens up a different way of seeing it and thinking about it, all its histories and its contexts. The examples I've used here help to reframe AI and break down some of its powerful story. We see histories and prehistories and silences and erasures. We read against the grain and listen to its hidden stories. This approach is sometimes called decolonization. This approach finds its shape in the social sciences and builds on two really simple ideas. Number one, the colonial act or another act of a powerful force encountering the world shapes reality, often through a violent rearrangement of facts, bodies and cultural institutions. It's also, in decolonization, possible to read earlier states and alternative possibilities inside that same reality, offering up a more complicated and complicating story. For me, decolonizing AI helps open up a space for all those different kinds of conversations. And how would such a conversation start? Well, it might start here. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am standing. This is Ngunnawal and Nambri land, never ceded, always sacred. And I pay my respects to the elders past and present of this place. I also acknowledge that we are gathering in many places today. And I pay my respects to the local traditional owners and elders of all those places too. It means a lot to me to get to say those words and to dwell on what they mean and what they signal. And to remember that we live in a country that has been continuously occupied for more than 60,000 years. Aboriginal people built worlds. They built social systems. They built technologies. They built a way to manage this place and to manage it remarkably over a protracted period of time. And every time any one of us stands on a stage as an Australian, here or abroad, we carry with us a privilege and a responsibility because of that history. And it's not just a history. It's a legacy of this place and it should run through all our bones and it should be the story we always tell and the story we always start with. And that's a responsibility I take really seriously and one that shapes all the work I'm doing here in Australia at the Australian National University. Here on Ngunnawal and Nambri land, we're building something new. We founded the 3A Institute nearly exactly three years ago, in September 2017. It has one deceptively simple mission, to establish a new branch of engineering to take AI safely, sustainably and responsibly to scale. So how do you build a new branch of engineering in the 21st century? Well, <laughs> we're teaching it into existence through experimental educational programs. We're researching into its existence with field sites as diverse as Shakespeare's birthplace and the Great Barrier Reef, not to mention the world's largest autonomous mine. And we're theorizing it into existence, paying attention to the complexities of cybernetic systems. We're working to build something new and something useful, and something that creates the next generation of critical thinkers and critical doers. We're doing this through a richer understanding of AI's many pasts and many stories, and by working collectively and collaboratively. By teaching and research and engagement, and by focusing as much on framing questions as problem solving. We're not building a single AI, we're making the possibility for many. We're actively working to decolonize our imaginations and to build a curriculum and a pedagogy that leaves room for many different conversations and possibilities. We're making and remaking, and I know we'll always be a work in progress.